We will have time for questions, but we ask that you save them until after all the speakers are finished, and then we'll have time for a, a question and answer period. Um, so next up will be Sean Carroll discussing dark energy and dark matter. Thanks. It's a great uh, to be here at Yearly Coes and a great pleasure to be talking about uh, the talk I'm going to give. I was told to talk about science, which I'm always happy to do, and in particular the remarkable story of contemporary cosmology. The interesting news is that the last 10 years will go down in human history as the time that we figured out what the universe is made of. This only happens once, but a thousand years from now we'll be told that the end of the 20th century, beginning of the 21st century, was the time when we got the inventory of the ingredients of which the universe is made. We got it not only in our imaginations, but in the data. And here's the answer. It's this nicely colorful pie chart. And the answer is that us, stuff like you and me, and atoms, are only 5% of the total stuff in the universe. We call this stuff ordinary matter, and we mean not only you and me, we mean gas and dust and planets and stars and everything visible in the universe, and everything made of every kind of particle that has ever been discovered in any experiment ever done here on Earth. 5% of the universe. 25% of the universe is something called dark matter. It's a kind of particle. It's a kind of particle that is dark. We don't see it. We haven't yet detected it in any experiment that we've done here on Earth, but we know it's there from its gravitational field. It's something new. We need to find it directly. 70% of the universe today is something called dark energy, something that is even more mysterious and interesting than dark matter. It's not made of particles. It's a kind of energy that is inherent in the fabric of empty space itself. So you can see the good news, bad news situation that we're in. The good news is we understand a lot about the universe. The bad news is it makes no sense. <laughs> Any one of you could have done a better job at designing a universe than this one. So, we, so that's great news for theoretical cosmologists whose job it is to take this story that the observers and experimenters have given us and to try to make sense of it. It's a full employment act for theoretical cosmologists. <laughs> So let's put ourselves in perspective here. We live in a universe that is big and getting bigger. This is an image taken by the Hubble Space Telescope called the Ultra Deep Field. This is what you get if you take the Space Telescope and you point it at a part of the sky that as far as you know is empty, and you just let it sit there and collecting photons for a long time. What it does is it resolves into images of individual galaxies. And if I were a braver speaker than I am, I would just put this picture up there and remain silent for 15 minutes, and then we'd have questions at the end, because you can just get a good impression of what the universe is like just by staring at this picture. There are about 100 billion galaxies in our observable universe. Each galaxy is a collection of stars orbiting each other, other under their mutual gravitational pull. We live in one of those galaxies. We live in the Milky Way galaxy, and it has about 100 billion stars in it. Every one of these little blobs there is a galaxy with approximately 100 billion stars, a galaxy sort of like our own, a galaxy with its own stars, its own planets, its own life forms, its own internet, and so forth. If you hear the phrase, the internets, this refers to all the different <laughs> internets that you get out there in the universe. And the universe is getting bigger. The galaxies are moving apart from each other. The amount of space in the universe is increasing. If you wind the movie backwards, everything was on top of everything else 14 billion years ago in a hot, dense state that we call the Big Bang. And that represents the place past which we don't know what the universe was doing. So 100 billion stars in every galaxy, 100 billion galaxies in the universe. The age of the universe is 100 billion if you measure it in dog years. <laughs> I'm not going to say this says anything about the relative importances of dogs versus human beings in the universe, but that's the only number you need to know, 100 billion, to understand the universe. But as good scientists, we don't just look at the picture and say that's pretty and we like it. We want to understand what's going on. We zoom in on the more interesting parts of it. Here's an interesting part of the universe called the bullet cluster. So not only do individual stars orbit around each other in galaxies, but galaxies, some of them, orbit around each other in clusters of galaxies. 
So this is an image taken by the Chandray X-ray Observatory of X-rays coming from this cluster of galaxies. And I'm showing you pictures of the NASA satellites that have taken a lot of these spectacular images because in the last year or two, NASA has canceled a whole huge array of planned future astronomical missions. So we need to enjoy the pictures that we have from the ones that have already been built because we're not going to be getting any more for a while. What happens in a cluster of galaxies is that most of the ordinary matter, most of the gas and dust and hydrogen and helium, is actually in between the galaxies. You couldn't see it if you just had optical eyes, but now that astronomers have become Superman and have X-ray vision, they can find where the ordinary matter is. Most of the ordinary matter is in between the galaxies. What happened in the bullet cluster is that you have two collections of galaxies. There's some galaxies right there. There's some galaxies right there. Two separate clusters, and they collided. These two clusters of galaxies went through each other, and the galaxies were just like flotsam on the top. They went right by. But the hot gas and dust in between the galaxies smacked into the hot gas and dust in the other cluster and was left in the middle. So you have almost all of the stuff in these two clusters of galaxies stuck in between and the galaxies moving apart. So you see the galaxies are over here, the galaxies are over there. In between is most of the stuff, the ordinary matter, in the form of hot X-ray gas. What we want to know is, where is most of the matter in this cluster of galaxies? Is it this hot X-ray gas, like we would think it might be, or is it something else? The way to figure that out was given to us by Time Magazine's person of the century, Albert Einstein, because Einstein taught us that gravity is caused by everything, and everything is affected by gravity. So even if you can't see something directly, you can detect that something is there, because if something is there, it's going to give rise to a gravitational field. And if it gives rise to a gravitational field, that field will act as a lens. The light that passes through a gravitational field will be deflected, just as light is deflected if it passes through a warped piece of glass. So we call this gravitational lensing. And the more deflection you have, the more stuff there is. So the technology has gotten to the point now where you can see a cluster of galaxies, look at galaxies that are in the background of that cluster, see how their images are distorted, and from that infer how much stuff is in the cluster of galaxies and where it is. And then you can make pretty pictures of that. And here is the pretty picture of the bullet cluster. This is dark matter vision. This is an reconstruction of where most of the stuff is in those two clusters that make up the bullet cluster. And what you see is that the stuff, the source of the gravitational field in the bullet cluster, is not where the ordinary matter is. When these two clusters collided, not only did the galaxies pass right through each other, but most of the mass passed right through the mass of the other cluster. It's something that is not made of atoms and hydrogen and stars. It is something that we haven't yet detected, and we call that dark matter. And we can weigh how much it is. The bullet cluster is actually not the dynamically most precise way of measuring the dark matter. It's just the prettiest picture that I can show you. Many, many, many different methods give us the same answer, and that answer is that there is five times as much dark matter in the universe as there is ordinary matter. And that is not the end of it, the even more surprising fact is that in between those clusters of galaxies, in the desolate cold of intergalactic space, there is energy there. There is something that we call dark energy. This is, in the best NASA tradition, a false color image of the dark energy. You take a little cubic centimeter of space, you remove from it everything. So there's no ordinary matter, there's no dark matter, there's no photons, it's empty. And you ask the question, how much energy is there in that cubic centimeter of empty space? According to Einstein, there's no reason why the answer needs to be zero. It's some number, it's some constant in nature, you need to go out and measure it, and we think we have measured it, and the answer is one one trillionth of an erg. How do you know? How do you know that this crazy number comes from the energy density of empty space? If empty space has energy, it would do two things. It would make the expansion of the universe accelerate. Not only would galaxies be moving apart, but the rate at which they move apart would grow, would get faster and faster. And it contributes to the total curvature of the whole universe. So we go out there and we look for these two phenomena. The first one, you measure how fast galaxies are moving away from us. You do that by looking for supernovae. A certain kind of supernova, an exploding star, happens once per century per galaxy. So you take your least favorite graduate students and you tell them to look at that galaxy. And every 100 years, they find a supernova.